Hey everybody, in this video we are going to take a look at a short interspersed element in the human genome, so a sign. So a short interspersed element in the human genome, probably the most important one is the most common one, which is called ALU. And the ALU element gets its name from a restriction endonuclease called ALU. And we are going to cover restriction endonucleases in the next video. So it turns out when you cut, when you digest, um, let me see, that's a jargony term you probably don't understand yet, but when you process, uh, the human genome with a restriction endonuclease like ALU, it, you get a bunch of fragments about 300 base pairs long. And uh, that's why, that's where the name comes from. So more on that in the next lecture. So the ALU element in the human genome exists in over 1 million copies. And the ALU element is about 300 base pairs long. So wow, so that'd be what, 300 million base pairs of our genome is comprised of just this many, many copies of this element. So the structure of ALU looks something like this. So there are two arms, a left arm and a right arm. And let's say this is part of a chromosome and just say this is one single ALU element with two parts. And we have the left arm and the right arm. And the left arm and the right arm are very similar in sequence. There are some unique regions here called A and B or the A box and the B box. The very beginning of the element is the plus one site for RNA polymerase 3. RNA polymerase 3. So this is the RNA polymerase that's mostly in charge of transfer RNA transcription and one of the ribosomal RNAs. So the left arm ends with a adenine-rich sequence and a similar adenine-rich sequence is found at the end of the right arm. And then there's a variable sequence, a variable length, depending on, you know, the 1 million copies. So they're very similar between this A region over here in the plus one site, but variable after this A rich region here. And they end with a stretch of T's. And a stretch of T's is the traditional termination signal for RNA polymerase three. So this, this element is transcribed by RNA polymerase 3 into a, a non-coding RNA. So it doesn't code its own proteins. It doesn't encode its own proteins. And so both of these arms, interestingly, appear to have evolved from a conserved RNA molecule called 7SL. So 7SL is a non-coding RNA and it is it forms part of the what is called the signal recognition particle and maybe you cover this in cell biology which would be uh, BSC203. So the signal recognition particle is made up of proteins and an RNA. The RNA component, the RNA molecule is 7SL. So that's a non-coding RNA that forms part of the signal recognition particle, SRP. So just like ribosomal RNAs form parts of ribosomes, uh, splice, uh, spliceosomal or small nuclear RNAs form part of spliceosomes, 7SL forms part of the signal recognition particle. The signal re recognition particle binds to the N-terminal end of some proteins. It helps transport those proteins to the correct locations in the cell, or if it's a protein that needs to be secreted from the cell, 
it, it'll help secrete, help make sure that protein gets secreted from the cell. So now it's important that um, these sequences are related to 7SL, or what I should say probably is the fact that they are related to S7SL uh, explains why their numbers have increased to such high levels in our genome. So, okay, so this is the 7SL RNA, so, so the natural human SL RNA. It forms a structure that looks something like this. So it's got a bunch of hairpins in it. And those hairpins are recognized by the single recognition, recognition particle proteins. So I can diagram those proteins in here. They're binding those hairpins. And the RNA with the proteins give us the signal recognition particle, so the complete particle. Now, the ALU transcript might look something like this. You know, it's going to be, there are, about, there are two sequences that look like 7SL, and so we'd expect something like this. And we also have an A-rich region at the end and in the middle. I'll just show the one at the end. And then it's going to be U, a U-rich region, right? There was T's before, but and in RNA, those will be U's. So what we'll get is the SRP proteins binding to the ALU RNA proteins of the signal recognition particle still going to bind the ALU RNA because it's very similar to the 7SL RNA and another protein called poly A binding protein poly A binding protein, which typically binds to poly A tails, is going to bind to the A rich region of the RNA. And the SRP proteins and the poly A binding protein both interact with ribosomes. Right? Because you need the SRP next to the ribosome to recognize those proteins that are being translated are being produced by the ribosome so the proteins can be transported to their correct locations in the cell right after production. And the poly A binding protein, well that normally interacts with ribosomes too because poly A binding protein is involved with, with binding to the poly A tail of messenger RNAs and helping transport those messenger RNAs to the ribosomes. So you've got two proteins or protein complexes that interact with the ribosomes also interacting with this ALU RNA, helping bring it to the ribosome. Okay, and when ALU is near the ribosome, what it can do is wait for translation of weight, and you're just actually waiting, it's just an RNA molecule, right? It's just kind of there. And uh, it's in the right place at the right time, because if, if it sits there long enough, eventually, the L1 protein, ORF2P, will be translated, right? So this is near the ribosome, that is, say, translating the L1 messenger RNA, which encodes ORF1P, ORF1P, which is the RNA binding protein, and ORF2P, which is the reverse transcriptase. Now, the reverse transcriptase is once it's translated, it binds that, that ALU RNA that's right near the ribosome. So ALU, we can think of it as what it does is it hijacks, hijacks ORF2P. Because remember with the L1 transposition mechanism, what ORF2B does is it binds that L1 messenger RNA right after the ORF 2P has been translated, and then it brings L1 messenger RNA back to the into the nucleus as part of the transposition mechanism, and it does that along with ORF1P. However, ALU doesn't need ORF1P; it just uses ORF2P, and it possibly stays in contact with the SRP proteins. So once ORF2P is made, 
ORF2P binds the ALU RNA and transports it into the nucleus where it integrates into the nucleus using the same mechanism, the same mechanism that L1 uses. And so what was that mechanism called? That mechanism was called T, sorry, TPRT for target primed reverse transcription. Okay, so here's a target. Let's say we can have a loose consensus sequence just like for L1, the consensus, loose consensus sequence of a target site. Might look something like that. You could put a bunch of N's in here. N means any base. So let's say this is a random location in the genome. Just like with L1, the ORF2P is going to, with the endonuclease activity, is going to make the NIC right here. We're going to have some unwinding. And let's say, I won't, I won't diagram all the bases this time. To put some dashes. Okay, so we have this little little tail right here that can anneal to that A-rich region, right, of the set of the ALU RNA. And remember, it ends with a U, so it doesn't have to be perfect. That U can be over here somewhere. That U three prime end. And we have that three prime hydrox hydroxyl of that thymine right there. And this line right here, what is this? This is the ALU RNA. And it might be in the hairpin structure still, and maybe that maybe the signal recognition particle proteins are still uh, bound to it. But eventually that will be unwound by the reverse transcription activity of, of what protein? Of ORF to P. So this protein has the endonuclease activity that cuts the target site, makes the NIC, possibly has the unwinding activity too, to allow the A-rich region at the three prime end of the ALU RNA to anneal. And once it's annealed, well, these T, this last T right here, primes reverse transcription. So this complementary DNA molecule that's complementary to the ALU RNA can be synthesized. We'll have the RNA DNA hybrid and then the, rec the rest of the integration mechanism into the genome will be identical to that of the L1 integration mechanism, which essentially all those details are, are haven't really been completely worked out. But our current model suggests this is how the ALU transposition mechanism happens. It hijacks the proteins, at least one of the proteins of the L1 element, or F2P, and by hijacking that, it's able to integrate back into the genome at a new location. So, again, so ALU is an example of a sign And like most signs, ALU is what we call in uh, a non-autonomous element. So non-autonomous element, what does that mean? Well, essentially the non-autonomous element or non-autonomous uh, retrotransposon or transposable element, I should probably put transposable element in here. Non-autonomous transposable element requires proteins uh, made by other elements, or I could say belonging to, belonging to other elements for their transposition mechanism. So the mechanism they use to move to new locations.
uh, requires proteins and enzymes made by other elements. So in contrast to an autonomous element, we have in contrast to a non-autonomous element, we have autonomous elements. And so we have an example of an autonomous element already, right? The L1 element is an autonomous element, right? It encodes its own proteins needed for its own movement. What are the proteins? ORF1P and ORF2P. And we cover it again, if you're a little confused, if you jumped into this video, uh, I guess video, it's called 2001, is the one where we talk about the L1 element and its transposition mechanism. But L1 encodes its own proteins, ORF1P and ORF2P, and those are the proteins required to move the L1 element to new locations in the genome. And it appears that the ALU element uses, requires just one of these proteins, ORF2P, for it to move to new locations. And that's why it's considered a non-autonomous element. So that's pretty neat, right, to think of. Uh, you have these elements, and we can consider these in some ways as selfish genetic elements. Both of these, L1, the L1 line element and the ALU sign element, we can consider them selfish genetic elements because they don't seem to serve a purpose in our genomes, right? except it seems like their only purpose is to increase their their own numbers and in some cases it's at our expense right so we, we saw a case where the l1 element led to um, becker becker's muscular dystrophy in a, a case of becker's muscular dystrophy so the alu element has been uh, shown to be a cause of 60 different human disease causing mutations now, I don't know if these are all uh, traditional genetic disorders, like xeroderma pigmentosum, um, or muscular dystrophy, or maybe they are uh, cases of cancer that are due to ALU insertions in, in uh, certain, certain genes. But we consider them to be selfish genetic elements. And, you know, the L1 element which makes these proteins for its own transposition, uh, you know, it, does, it seems like it doesn't benefit from the ALU element but use hijacking its proteins to increase its copy numbers. You would think that would uh, negatively influence the chance of L1 increasing its numbers. So we have L1 taking advantage of our genome and then we have ALU taking advantage of our genome and L1's proteins. So a lot of interesting things going on in uh, this, this example here, a question. Okay, so uh, that's it for this part of the course on transposable elements in the next